New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Now let's have the truth, Whitey. Where did you get that suit of clothes? Uh, the fellow that got croaked, he took them off and gave them to me himself. Uh-huh, and I suppose he gave you his shirt and socks and necktie, too? Sure, sure. He said I'd need him to go with his suit. And he stopped the car so I could put him on. Was that when you tried to kill him? No, Chief. That's when he tried to kill me. Oh, Nick, this isn't getting us anywhere. You're wrong, Patsy. Now I know who really killed Mr. Ratwell. Now, the case of the unexpected corpse. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning as Nick and Patsy enter the office of Sheriff Tabor in the little town of Plain City, Texas. Hiya, Sheriff. Hello, Sheriff Tabor. Well, I'll be dog. Nick Carter and Patsy <laughs> Bone. What are you two doing out this way? Why, well, we're on our way back home from California, Sheriff. And since we had to come through Texas anyway, I reminded Nick of that invitation you gave us three years ago. Remember? Sure, I remember. <laughs> and you got here just at the right time. We had a murder last night. Oh, now, wait, Sheriff. This is purely a social visit. A murder? Here in Plain City? Well, oh, about ten miles east of here. A big oil man from Dallas named uh, Leonard Atwell. He was shot and killed by some hitchhiker. Now, look, Sheriff. Well, I... how do you know it was a hitchhiker, Sheriff? Well, because we know Atwell started out from Dallas alone. Uh-huh. And when he we found the body, it was behind the wheel of his car with powder burns and a bullet hole in the right side of his head. Well, that sounds more like suicide. No, no, it couldn't have been that. The gun was gone, so was Atwell's money, his watch, and a big gold signet ring that he always wore. You found any clues yet? No, can't tell yet. I had everything that was in the car brought up here to my office and spread them out on those big tables over there. Come on, I'll show you. Well, I... I, uh, I put the tools uh, from the car in this table here, see? Mm -hmm. Now, I wonder uh... what I used this piece of rubber tubing for. Yeah, search me. Now, over here, these were the clothes he was aware. I see. see. Hey, what's this little piece of adhesive tape? Well, that was on his right hand. There was a little scratch there. Oh. Now, look at this piece of tape. Hmm? See that flaw in the weave where it was torn off the roll? Mm, yeah. thing like that might be a clue. Sure. Now, uh, on this table here, I got his suitcases and the stuff that was in them. Clothes, mostly. Hmm, this looks interesting. Last will and testament of Leonard Frank Atwell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he left everything to his wife in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Thought he was from Dallas. Well, he was, but he deserted his wife in Detroit 18 years ago. Uh, there's a letter there in that envelope marked to be opened in case of my death, asking her to forgive him and all that stuff. Looks like he must have been carrying that around a long time. Yeah, I guess so. I uh, suppose a man like that carried a lot of insurance. Mm, $150,000 worth. Oh, golly. Took out the policy only a couple of months ago. Right here in Plain City, by the way. $150,000, huh? Uh -huh. Who gets it? Well, the wife, I guess. She's the sole heir. And the policy's made out to his estate. Hey, Sheriff, I don't see any first aid kit here. No, there wasn't one in the car. Just that stuff you see here. Well, then where'd he get that strip of adhesive tape? It's perfectly clean. He couldn't have had it on more than a few minutes. Well, maybe when he cut his hand, he stopped at a filling station or a lunchroom, and they fixed it up for him. Say, Patsy, now that sure sounds reasonable. Yeah, maybe if you can find that filling station or lunchroom, you can get a description of the man who was riding with that well just before he was killed. Say, that's a great idea. I'll do that. Couldn't have driven more than a few miles without getting the tape soiled, and if he should be... Uh, uh, I'm sorry to butt in, Sheriff. That's okay, Buck. Folks, this is Buck Henderson, my uh, deputy. That's Mr. Carter... And Miss Bowen. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? Hello, Buck. Uh, this telegram just come, and I thought it might be important. Oh, thank you, Buck. Oh, uh, say, Buck. Yes, yeah, Sheriff? I want you to hop in your car and start out on the highway toward Dallas. Stop at every filling station and lunchroom along the way and find out if Atwell stopped there last night. Good gravy, Sheriff. Dallas is 290 miles. Never mind. You just do what I... Well, I'll be dogged. Something wrong? Why, this telegram... It's from the chief of police in Dallas. 
You see, I wired him to send someone out to Atwell's home address and tell the folks there what had happened. Well? Well, the chief says they ain't no such address. It's a vacant lot. We uh, came out here to see you, Colonel Gardner, because you knew Mr. Atwell better than anyone in the county. Well, yes. In the course of our business dealings, we became very close friends. Mm -hmm. His death has been a terrible shock to me. You have any idea why he should have given a false address? No, but I'm sure it wasn't done with any intent to deceive. I've never known a more honorable gentleman than Leonard Atwell. Oh? Then you didn't know he deserted his wife? His wife? Atwell told me he was a bachelor. Well, you'll get a chance to meet the bachelor's wife this afternoon. She's coming here? Yep. When I uh, notified her of his death, she wired back that she was taking the next plane. Colonel Gardner, would you mind telling us the nature of your business dealings with Mr. Atwell? Not at all. He bought some oil leases from me. $130,000 worth. Well, you didn't sign those leases over to him without getting the money, did you? Uh, as a matter of fact, it did. What? He gave me a certified check for 40000 at the time, and he was on his way here last night to pay the balance and pick up his note. You mean the hitchhiker who killed him got away with $90,000? Oh, no, Miss Bowen. It uh, wouldn't have been in cash, of course. Oh. This sure to be a warning to you, Colonel, not to go picking up folks on the road. I'm afraid I'm too old to change my ways now, Sheriff. You make a habit of doing that, Colonel? Why, every tramp in the, in the country knows that this ranch is good for a meal and a night's lodging. Why, last winter, an old hobo got sick and died here. And the Colonel even paid for his funeral. Let well, up. Sheriff, there's little enough that we can do for those less fortunate than ourselves. Oh, uh, excuse me, please. Hello. Yes. Yes, he's here. Just a minute. For you, Sheriff. Oh, thanks, Colonel. Let's speak from the courthouse. Hello? Yes, this is Sheriff Tabor. You did? When? Yeah? Uh-huh, fine. Fine, I'll come right back to town. Oh, Nick, we got him. A murderer? Yep. Caught him trying to peddle Atwell's ring and watch. Is it somebody from around here? No, it's some old bum, just like I thought. I'm sorry to rush off, Colonel, but we got a killer to take care of. Oh, you got me wrong, Chief. Honest, I never croaked nobody. Then where'd you get his watch and ring? I told you, I found and him. And that suit he was wearing, I suppose you found that too, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's right, Chief. It was all rolled up in a bundle, like at the side of the road. Now, look, you, whatever your name is. Hey, it's Morgan, Chief. Whitey Morgan. Okay, Morgan. Now, why don't you open up and tell us what you did with the gun? I never had no gun. I'm a bum, sure, but I never hurt nobody in all my life. You hitched a ride with a gray-haired guy in a big sedan last night, didn't you? No. No, I never you did. You pulled the gun and you made him drive off on a side road. I've never seen the guy, honestly. And after you killed him, you took his watch and ring. Then you opened up his suitcases and got yourself a new suit of clothes. No, didn't you, huh? no, no, I swear huh? I didn't. Uh, no. Hey, look, Chief, you wouldn't send me to the pen for something I didn't do, would you? It ain't the pen you're headed for, brother. It's the electric chair. But Nick, he's bound to be the guy. How else would he get Atwell's watch and ring? And those clothes, they were Atwell's too. Okay, Sheriff, but why didn't he have any money in his pockets? You said Atwell always carried a lot of cash. Yes, but you didn't think he really did find that stuff, do you, Nick? No. If ever I saw a man trying to lie out of a bad situation, it was Morgan. But, well, that's pretty slim evidence in which to convict him of murder. Hey, Sheriff. Yes? Yeah? Oh, Sheriff, I found it. The place where Atwell got the adhesive tape? Well, I don't know about that, but he stopped at a filling station about 30 miles up the line and had the oil changed in his car while he was eating dinner. Good work, Buck. Yeah, and there was somebody with him, too, sort of an old gent with white hair. Whitey Morgan. I knew it. I got the kid from the filling station out in the office. You want to talk to him? Well, I can't right now. Not, not right now, Buck. Miss Atwell's due in about five minutes, and I've got to go down and, and uh, meet her. Uh, come on, Nick. The uh, undertaking parlors are at the back of the store here, Miss Atwood. Oh. I, uh, I want you to identify the body, just for the record, you I know. can't believe it. After all these years, poor Leonard. 
Judging by the letter he left, he must have still thought a great deal of you, Mrs. Atwell. Yes, I don't suppose he ever married again or he'd have left the money to his second wife. Yeah, quite a pile, too. 150000 on the insurance alone. I can't imagine Leonard getting rich. Why, 20 years ago, he couldn't even hold a job. Uh, right through this door, ma'am. All right. The blue casket over there. And to think everybody used to call him lazy and shiftless. I guess now they'll... <gasps> What's the matter, Mrs. Atwell? Why, th- that's not... Not your husband? Or... Oh, yes, of, co- of course that's Leonard, but... Uh... But what? Well, naturally, he's changed a lot in 18 years. But that's definitely Leonard Atwell. Sure it is, Nick. I know him myself. Everybody in town did. All right, then. Since we've identified the victim, suppose we go back to the jail and see what the kid from the filling station can tell us. You're sure you'd know this man if you saw him again, Whitaker? Oh, sure, sure. Him and Mr. Atwell stood around waiting while I finished changing the oil, and I got a right good look at him. Now, uh, Uh, Whitaker? Yeah? When my deputy brings the suspect in here, I don't want you to say anything till I ask you. Oh, no, 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 sir. By the way, did you notice a strip of adhesive tape on Mr. Atwell's right hand? Uh, Adhesive? Well, I I don't think he had none, or I'd have noticed it when when he paid me for the oil. Here they are. Oh, Oh, Chief... Chief, you're going to let me go now. That's why you had me brung in here, ain't it? So as you can turn me loose, huh? Well, that all depends, Whitey. Do you still say that you didn't hitch a ride last night with a gray-haired man in a big sedan? Oh, Chief, so help me. I never seen the guy in the car, neither. How about that, Whitaker? No, no, he he's a liar, Sheriff. That's the fella that was with Mr. Atwell when they stopped at the filling station. I'll swear it on a stack of Bibles a foot high. <laughs> With the filling station attendant's identification, the case against Whitey Morgan seems complete. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now, back to the case of the unexpected corpse. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. After a sleepless night in the county jail, Whitey Morgan has sent word that he's ready to tell the truth. And the sheriff has asked Nick to accompany him to Whitey's cell. Now, let's have the confession, Whitey. You admit you were lying about where you got that suit of clothes. Yeah, Chief. I didn't find him. This fellow that got croaked, he gave him to me. You what? He did, so help me. Right after he picked me up on the highway, he said it was an old suit that was getting too tight for him. And that he... suit was brand new. I don't care. That's what he told me. I suppose the shirt and socks and the necktie, they were too tight for him, too, huh? Well, he yeah. said I'd need them to go with the suit. Then later, when it got good and dark, he stopped the car so as I could get out and put him on. And that's when you killed him? No. No, honest, Chief. That's when he tried to kill me. Now, wait a minute. He did. I put on the clothes he gave me, and then when I was getting back in the car, he slugged me with a wrench. I seen it coming too late to duck, and that's all I know till I come to in a ditch someplace else. Someplace else? Yeah. He must have hauled me there in the car and dumped me out for dead. Yeah, so he got you all dressed up so you'd die happy, huh? Even gave you his watch and ring. I don't know nothing about the watch and ring. When I come to, I was wearing them. Oh, Whitey. Whitey. Whitey, when you were in the car with Atwell, did you notice a piece of adhesive tape on his right hand? Uh, no. There was nothing on his hand. You're sure? Yeah. What difference does it make, Nick? You're not going to swallow this crazy story, are you? Why didn't you tell us this at first, Whitey? Well, when the chief here said the guy had been croaked, I I got scared. I didn't think he'd believe me. You bet I wouldn't. And take it from me, brother. Neither will the jury. Hiya, Sheriff. Hi, Nick. Hello, Patsy. Hi. Well, where have you two been all afternoon? Oh, lots of places. The post office, the photographers, the garage where you put Atwell's car. What'd you go there for? Wanted to check the speedometer. It registers 9,485 miles. And that boy changed the oil in the car at 9,427, according to the sticker inside the door. So what? Well, from that filling station to where the body was found is a distance of 24 miles. 
From that spot to the garage here is 10 miles. That's 34 altogether. Yeah. But the car had been driven 58 miles. See what I mean, Sheriff? Atwell must have driven 24 miles out of his way for that piece of adhesive tape. For the love of Pete, Nick, I think that you're touched on the subject of that tape. We uh, found something else, too, Sheriff. Yeah? A spot of blood on the floor in the rear of Atwell's car. I'm going to have it analyzed to see if it could possibly have come from that cut on Whitey's head. Oh, Nick, don't tell me that you take any stock in that wild story of his. Why, any five-year-old kid could make up a better lie than that. And uh, so could Whitey, unless it happens to be true. But he's got to be lying. Why would Atwell give all that stuff to a tramp, then hit him over the head and throw him out of the car? Look, let me ask you a couple of questions, Sheriff. You said the suitcases were both neatly packed and locked. Why would Whitey repack them after killing Atwell and stealing the clothes? Why, I... Uh... And what happened to the money Atwell always carried? Okay, okay, I give up. But do you know the answers? No, not all of them. But I can guess at a few. For instance... Atwell took out a lot of insurance only two months ago, payable to his estate. Yeah. Now, suppose Atwell planned to stage a fake accident with a car. And suppose he planned on having Whitey's body found behind the wheel, wearing his clothes, his watch, and his ring. Yes, but he couldn't get away with it. Everybody in town knew Atwell. Yeah, Whitey and Atwell were both about the same size and age. They both had gray hair. And if the body were badly burned... Burned? Remember that piece of rubber tubing? It had been just the thing for siphoning gasoline out of the tank to be sure that the fire burned everything it was supposed to. Why, every insurance company knows that trick, Sheriff. It's been done a hundred times. Yes, but Atwell didn't do that. There wasn't any accident. The car wasn't burned. All right, maybe something went wrong at the last minute, and the plan was changed. I know. Remember how surprised Mrs. Atwell looked when she saw the body? Yes, I know, but she explained that. Yes, and she has some more explaining to do. I've been in touch with the Detroit police. And the surprise she got yesterday is nothing to the one I have in store for her today. Mrs. Atwell, you recognize this picture? Well, where did you get that? The uh, Detroit police found it in the bedroom of your apartment and transmitted it here to Nick by wire photo. Isn't that a picture of your husband? Well, yes, but... Well, it was taken more than 20 years ago, and he... Let me see it, Nick. Yeah, yeah, that's Atwell, all right. But I wouldn't have known it unless I was looking for the resemblance. Now, look at this picture. What is it? An ear? Right, Sheriff. The left ear of Leonard Atwell enlarged 50 times from that snapshot. You see, Mrs. Atwell, ears are as individual as fingerprints. They never change from birth to death, except in size. Say, I didn't know that. And this ear, Leonard Atwell's ear, is an entirely different shape from that of the man you identified yesterday as your husband. <gasps> All right, I, I I lied about it. I knew that wasn't Leonard. But, but I... But, Nick, it is Atwell. I know him myself. You mean you knew the man who posed as Leonard Atwell? I don't understand. Why should anyone do that? There's one obvious reason, Mrs. Atwell. That $150,000 insurance money. Hey, I get it, Nick. He was going to fake the accident like you said and split the money with her. But then she killed him in order to keep it all to herself. Y- you're accusing me of... Of murder, you bet I am. No, 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 Sheriff. According to the Detroit police, Mrs. Atwell was attending a bridge party the night of the murder. I checked that angle. Well, she could have hired somebody to do it for her, couldn't she? Perhaps, but I don't think so. There was big money behind this impersonation. Nick? Nick, I have an idea. Didn't the colonel say that he signed those oil leases over to Atwell absolutely? Yes, in return for a check and a promissory note for the balance. Then maybe that was the real reason behind it. And the insurance was only part of the scheme to carry out the idea that he was a rich man. If you think he was cheating the colonel, you're barking up the wrong tree, Patsy. Nobody gets ahead of that old bird. Yeah, but the dead man did get absolute title to $130,000 worth of oil leases. And all he actually paid out was 40000 Well, even if the colonel never gets another cent, he's doing all right. What do you mean? Why, those leases ain't worth anything. He couldn't have peddled them to anybody around here for more than five or ten thousand. So that's it. Come on, Patsy. Huh? Hey, where are you going? To look for a roll of adhesive tape. Here's my first aid kit, Mr. Carter. Oh, it's an awfully big one, isn't it? Oh, on a ranch, you never know what may happen, Miss Bowen. May I look through the kit, Colonel Gardner? Certainly, Mr. Carter. But I'd like to know why you're so interested. I'm interested because the man who was murdered two nights ago had a fresh grip of adhesive tape on his right hand. 
And I'm wondering whether it came from here. But Atwell never got to my ranch. I told you he was on his way. I know that's what you said, Colonel. But there was an extra 24 miles in his speedometer. In other words, he must have made a side trip of 12 miles and back. And this ranch is exactly 12 miles off the main highway. Are you calling me a liar, sir? Worse than that, Colonel. I'm calling you a murderer. Ridiculous. Leonard Atwell was my friend. The man who called himself Leonard Atwell was your stooge. You paid his expenses for four months while he built up the illusion of being a wealthy oil promoter. You're out of your mind. Why should I do such a thing? So that he could take out a big life insurance policy payable to his estate. And then make a will, starting with the usual clause about paying all just debts. Meaning that promissory note you hold, Colonel. There's a neat way to collect $90,000 for your worthless oil leases. <laughs> You're imagining things. Maybe so. The way I see it, the plan went like this. Atwell picked up somebody who roughly resembled him, dressed him in his clothes, then knocked him out. This man was Whitey Morgan, who was to be found dead in Atwell's car and would be taken for Atwell because his body would be too burned for positive identification. Then you and Atwell would share the money you would collect from Atwell's estate because of that note for $90,000 you held. But when Atwell, with Morgan's unconscious body in his car, came here to get your help in faking the accident, you decided that a substitute wasn't as effective as the real thing, so you killed Atwell. This is ridiculous. Then you emptied Atwell's pockets to make it look like a robbery. Then you took the unconscious Morgan miles away and dumped him by the side of the highway knowing he'd be the logical suspect in Atwell's murder. And you didn't burn the car because it was no longer necessary with a real Atwell dead in it. How do you expect to prove any such wild story? Atwell had no adhesive tape on his hand when he picked up Morgan. He did have it when he was found dead. If that tape came from your first aid kit, it'll prove he was here after he had set Morgan up for the fake killing. A very interesting theory, Carter. But not proof. You'll hand me the roll of adhesive tape from your kit. I think it'll give me the proof I need. Very well. All right. What? Get your hands up, both of you. Nick, he had a gun in the kit. Yes. I put it there when I went out of the room to get this kit, Carter. I thought there was something odd about your wanting to inspect my first aid supplies. Why? Why? Because you remember the last time you used that kit was just before the murder? (laughs) A very shrewd guess, Mr. Carter. So you did kill that man, just as Nick said. With this very gun, my dear. It's too bad that you have to be so clever, Mr. Carter. What do you mean by that? I mean that you two are the only people who suspect I killed that stupid fool. So I'm going to kill both of you. Right now. With his hands in the air, Nick hasn't a chance of reaching his own gun before Colonel Gardner's finger closes on the trigger. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Unexpected Corpse. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. In the living room of Colonel Gardner's ranch house, Nick and Patsy stand with their hands in the air, staring at the revolver in the colonel's hands as he says, You two are the only ones who suspect I killed that stupid fool. So I'm going to kill both of you. Right now. You're wrong, Colonel. The sheriff knows all about this. I told him not half an hour ago. (laughs) I'm too good a poker player to fall for a bluff like that, Carter. This is no bluff, Colonel. Drop that gun. Table, you. Yes, Colonel. I've been standing outside that window. That was a mighty interesting confession. And thanks for telling us that this is the gun you killed your partner with. Why, Nick, you were right about this adhesive tape. It does match that strip on the dead man's hand. You can tell by that same flaw in the weave. So... Even if we didn't have the gun, that would prove he was here just before he was murdered. You're pretty smart, Nick. No mistake. By the way, Colonel, will you tell us why Atwell, or whatever his name was, had that adhesive tape on his hand? He scratched it while he was getting his suitcase out of the luggage compartment. Didn't amount to anything, but it was bleeding some. Well, Colonel, you ought to be right proud. You'll go down in history as the first man who ever hung himself with a piece of adhesive tape. Well, Patsy, I hope we can get home without any more distractions. Uh Uh-huh. Nick, do you suppose they'll ever find out what happened to the real Leonard Atwell? Well, Patsy, that came out in the colonel's confession. Remember the sheriff telling us about that old bum that died on the colonel's ranch last winter? What? 
He was Leonard Atwell? Nobody else. When the colonel went through his effects, he found that letter to his wife asking her to forgive him for deserting her 18 years ago. Uh Uh-huh. That's where the colonel got the idea for cashing in on those worthless oil leases. Well, then it's no wonder the false Atwell resembled the picture of the real one. The colonel knew the type of person he needed for the impersonation. And he found him in Hollywood. A broken-down movie extra with a shady reputation. Uh Uh-huh. You know, Nick, I bet he never knew to the last minute that he was cast as the corpse in the colonel's little drama. Well, that corpse was an unexpected shock to almost everyone. Mrs. Atwell expected it to be her husband. The imposter expected it to be Whitey. And only the colonel knew who the unexpected corpse really was. And, um, he wasn't telling. And now, Nick... How about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Well, Mike, if you were a young man with all the money you wanted, and if you had everything in the world to live for, can you think of any reason why you would want to die? I can't think of a reason for wanting to die under any circumstances. Well, a young man named Miles Kincaid had a different attitude. Yes, he was found drowned in a lake, and yet he wasn't drowned in a lake. And before the case was over, Nick uncovered the reason for not just one, but for three mysterious deaths. Well, it sounds as though we're in for a lot of excitement as well as mystery. What do you call the adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Flowery Farewell. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silver. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.